Hello guys and welcome back to Buy Founders Talk from Temi, an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Once again guys, I don't know what's wrong with me, I've got another cold in summer, 32 degrees here, so apologies for uh, for if I'm going to be sneezing and coughing today, I have taken as much medication as allowed, um, so hopefully it uh, will happen and all will be good. Uh, as you can see, guys, we've got our next guest, Conrad Ford, uh, Chief Product and Strategy Officer at Conrad. You have to help me here. Is it Alicia, Alicia Bank or Alicia? I, I was trying to uh, pronounce it. Yeah, you did better than most. With, most with Alica Bank. Yeah, that's right. Alica. Alika, Alika. Uh huh. Okay, Conrad. What I want to do before we get started, just want to get to know you a little bit more. So, tell me, um, what is one thing about you that not many people know about you? One kind of uh, quality you have, or secret you have, a hobby. Uh, well, I think I think probably the most interesting thing about me professionally is I didn't get my first permanent job until I was twenty-seven, so I was a bit of wow. a late starter. Um, yeah, and I was actually surrounded both in my university and also in my career by people who kind of went went straight into what in the UK would be called the milk ground, which is a, a, a kind of a, a, where they go around the top universities mm. and find promising graduates and, and, and stick them into a boot camp. But yeah, so I, I, I took a very different path. I spent most of my 20s traveling um, uh, whilst also doing some work as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think the resisting back to that is uh, an unpredictable late starter. And did you, I didn't see this in your, uh, in your bio, did you go to university before or after all the traveling? Uh, I went to university before, so I was at uh, uh, Cambridge University many, many years ago, a very long time ago, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, so I stumbled out of university without a particular plan, uh, from the fact that I was quite interested in going to see the world. And it turned out it was a much slower travel than I thought it was, so I thought I'd see the world in six months. Uh -huh. So we spent somewhat longer than that. Wow. Okay, we will definitely talk about this a little bit more later on, because obviously uh, people do say a lot of the time that uh, it, traveling is one of the experiences that most people have to get, and it helps you in your career and your life and understanding life. So we will talk about that. We're talking about a little bit of your challenges a bit later on. But before we get started, tell me in a sentence or two, what is it you're doing there at Alica Bank? Yeah, so I'm on the leadership team. Um, I, I like to jokingly call myself Chief AOB Officer. Um, in, in other words, You've got the kind of obvious role titles like Chief Financial Officer in the bank, Chief Risk Officer. It's mm -hmm. as you can probably guess it's really important. And of course, the Chief Executive. But um, my, my leadership responsibility is quite broad. Um, uh, and it covers, at the moment, product, marketing, and strategy and partnerships. Uh, but I have, in my time, my three coming up to three years, I've been responsible for a range of things. <laughs> I think one of the reasons that I was brought into the organization by our CEO is because I was immediately prior to my current role, I was a, I was a founder CEO. Uh, so I founded and led a quite successful fintech business. Uh, and because I've been a, a CEO uh, and as a founder CEO, and indeed the sole founder of the business, um, uh, you whether you like it or not, you have to learn all the elements of running a business. Uh, and actually, I find you know one of the challenges of being a CEO, certainly for me, was that the your natural comfort zone is to spend more time on the stuff you're naturally good at. Um, uh, or, or have deeper experience, but that's kind of the opposite of how you should spend your time. Mm -hmm. Because generally, the bits that you're less good at are less experienced, so the bits that aren't working well. So anyway, yeah, so long story short, I have what is fashionably called range, I think, these days. So there's quite a lot of research recently that shows that people who kind of went very early into a career or a specialism, in the end, actually end up, to be, uh, end up being less, less effective. And indeed, when you look at the history of science, um, most major scientific discoveries have happened when somebody from outside of a discipline has got involved in the discipline because they have a different perspective. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that by accident, I became somebody who has range. Uh, and I think that's one of my career strengths. In case. Very interesting. Um, I have hope for myself then as well, then, because... I definitely started a bit later. I went to university when I was 21, when all of my friends were finishing university, because uh, I was doing some other bits and pieces before that. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> fingers crossed. And I have to say, I'm definitely increasingly unconvinced of the value of university. So, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, there's true stories for me is that when I made the, as a founder CEO, kind of the most expensive and probably most important hire I ever made. Um, I kind of had met this person and just thought this is the person I need. Um, at the mm -hmm. time, we needed someone to sort of bring to life our sales engine. I just saw in this person something special. Anyway, so I realized as I was walking to a board meeting that actually the salary of the person was above my personal authorization. In other words, I should have got board approval. Uh -huh. And I'd already gone ahead and made the hire. So I thought, well, okay, I just need to go in and ask for forgiveness. 
And I suddenly realized I didn't even know if they'd gone to, to university. In other words, I'd got to the point of just having, thinking it was that, having a loud limb the effectiveness of someone. Uh, and I think that's kind of, you know, what, you know, as, as we become more and more data strip and we begin to see pattern recognition, I think one of the things I've clearly learned by that point in time is that university doesn't actually mean a huge amount in terms of how good someone is in their career role. Absolutely. Do you think that is even so more now, uh, in, especially in the fintech world? Uh, is it becoming more kind of evident that people shouldn't have to go to university to become a specialist and successful in the fintech world? Well, that's certainly the conclusion I've reached. I mean, clearly, you know, if, you, if you're going to be a lawyer, for example, you need to study law. <laughs> you shouldn't be a doctor, you need to study medicine, right? Mm. So uh, um, it's it's not an entirely sweeping statement, but I have to say that I've personally begun to find that it's, uh, you know, um, let's say a few years after university, uh, after university or after school, really what they've done with themselves and the period in between is what really matters. And I think um, at the heart of that is, I mean, a couple of observations is I've found as I've gone through my career that there is surprisingly little correlation between intelligence and, educa and or education and decision-making capability. In other words, to put it another way around, many, many multiple times in my career, I've been sitting across the table from somebody in a one-to-one -one or a meeting, whatever it is. I just think they're thinking, you know, this person on paper is extremely intelligent, um, uh, um, but, you know, with that set of facts, how, can, how on earth could you have reached that conclusion? Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, I think there, I think if I ever do a, if I ever leave the working world and go and do a PhD, and I think I'm going to get my Nobel Prize by actually proving there is such a thing as common sense, because some people have very good decision making. And then the other one, which is actually more important than decision making, is some people just have natural grit and determination drive, and some people don't have it. Um, and what you find as you build an organization is that it's really actually quite depressing thought that actually it turns out a very small proportion of the people in your business really drive the vast majority of the results. Now that may feel, sound like a really, really strong statement, but we've kind of got a live experiment of that happening right now because of course Elon Musk took over Twitter, uh -huh. got rid of what I believe was 80% of the, of, 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 of the staff there. And guess what? Twitter still works. Mm. So, um, you know, now whether that turns out to be a good or a bad business decision, I think time will tell. But it is quite stark, of course, that the business is perfectly capable of functioning without the vast majority of, it, of, of what was seen as, a, as normal headcount. So I think uh, you know, one of the things I've found as I've built businesses is certain people are extremely and extraordinarily effective and their force multiplies. Um, and, you know, if you find enough of those people, you know, all you have to do is get the strategy and the culture right because you will win because in the end you've got the execution capability. Really interesting. You, you you spoke at the beginning about obviously uh, you founding companies yourself uh, and uh, being CEO of companies. Um, what was the difference for you when you went uh, to Annika? Obviously, you went from um, CEO positions in the past, founding positions in the past, uh, to your chief product position. What was the biggest challenge with doing so? Because obviously, going from the I guess the top dog. So maybe not so much anymore being the person who has to well, listen more to to the top dog. What was the challenge there? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because so I'd stood down from the business I founded um, and I was, you know, I, I'd stood down at kind of the right time. One of the hardest things to do as a founder is to find the time to step off without substantially harming the business or harming your own reputation. Um, so I stood down for the business I founded in, in you know, a period of a of many years of exponential growth, genuinely exponential growth, with a strong leadership team, a strong board. So you know, there was over a time to leave Elegant when he was there, uh, albeit it's never easy. And then I was I was lucky enough to have a few months off just to reflect. So uh, I, I you know it's a, I think something that's not talked about much is founder mental health, but it is extraordinarily bruising to be a founder. I think particularly a sole founder. Mm -hmm. um, so you know I just do some downtime. I need to recharge my batteries basically and recover my sanity. And I concluded at that point in time, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to found another company. I didn't want to be CEO again, both of those things. So um, in terms of not founding a company, that is certainly not a never say never decision. I may could do it again. But at the point in my life I was in at that point in time, um, you know, it felt like the right thing not to found another company. Uh, and then in terms of not, not wanting to be a CEO again, I may be a CEO again, but, you know, many of us spend our career wanting the top job and then realizing when you get the top <laughs> job, it's not quite up to me. Yeah. I've already touched on one reason, which is you actually have to spend most of your time on the stuff you don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're responsible for everything. You can't just pick and choose the fun bits or what you think are the fun bits. Uh, but also, you know, the enormous weight of responsibility of being CEO. There were a number of times, you know, when I was CEO, I would have one of my divisional 
heads sitting in front, a bunch of heads sitting in front of me, and, and I'm telling them their tales of woe, uh, how the world was on their shoulders and all the problems they had. I'm just sitting there thinking, I've got half a dozen of you, right? I've got six times the problems. <laughs> Why are you bringing me problems? You know? mm-hmm. So uh, um, you, you do have the weight of the world on your shoulders, particularly particularly as a founder, because in the end, right, every single person, they're relying on you. And, and, and indeed, they actually bought into you. They're then looking to you to actually pay their mortgages, look after their families, etc. It's a huge responsibility. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I didn't want either of those things immediately in the aftermath of, of the business I founded and scaled. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so clearly the outcome of that was, you know, I'm short of retiring, um, which was not going to happen. Um, that I had to go and work for someone again, mm-hmm. um, and I did. You know, I did really reflect on whether whether I would be able to do that. I want to be clear about that. And actually, when I eventually took the job at Alaka, I remember being interviewed by the board directors, and they they all understood that I could do the job. The one question they wanted answered is, are you going to be happy? In other words, I think what you're implicitly asking. So I was super lucky is the short answer, because um, the chief executive of Alaka, who was taking over Alaka at the time, is somebody I know well uh, uh-huh. and like him. So we'd worked together many years ago, and we'd stayed in touch, and he's an yeah. amazing CEO, a, a you know, world-class CEO. So I knew that if I was going to work for anybody, it was a lucky coincidence I should get to work for somebody I knew what I knew, you knew and liked, and then frankly would be a better CEO than I could ever be. So um, yeah, but you know, to be clear, it was uh, there was a lot of reflection that went into that, and of course it could have gone horribly wrong because you know I was used to being my own boss, and but um, yeah. it turned out to be a decision. But who knows what I may do next? You know, I'm, I'm not done yet. Uh, Conrad, um, very interesting. And you're saying, obviously, the, about the, the pressure and the world on your shoulders. Um, our audience is uh, other leaders, other co-founders, other C-level um, individuals out there. What uh, could be the best bit of advice that you could give someone to be able to handle that that weight on your shoulders? How do you, can you handle it? I mean, in the end, right, you, you either can or you can't. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I'm sure there's coping mechanisms, right? But, you know, I look back on certainly some of the earlier days of, of, of running the business. I found a business called Funding Options. Um, and, you know, I, I look back and there were periods when I was definitely having anxiety attacks, for example, right? I'm not sure I recognized them as such at the time, but I certainly did have them, you know, not all the time. I, I had periods. You know, that nothing, if you've never been a founder of business, so in other words, you've always spent your job as a salaried employee. And even if you're the salaried employee at the top, you can never quite understand the weight on your shoulders of knowing you might not be able to pay your colleagues um, uh, um, you know, at the end of the month. Uh, and indeed, you might have to walk into the room and say, we can't pay your salary and it's all over. Uh, and actually, you speak to most founders who are in a position to speak honestly, which generally means they've moved on because you can't speak honestly. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Almost every single one has the battle, the battle, you know, that kind of that, that's the war story that they always go back to. That's the moment. Um, and I certainly had a couple of those along the way, certainly in the early stages. So to some extent, you just build resilience, right? And I think one of my great strengths now is I understand what a real crisis is. I remember quite early when I, after I joined Alec, when there was, you know, what for me would have been, like, <laughs> you know, kind of a two out of tennis crisis um, uh, had, had, had occurred. And I was like, going, it's everyone just calm down. We're going to get through this, yeah. Um, because I'd seen what a 10 out of 10 crisis looks like. Oh, so, um, yeah, you, you build resilience or you don't. Um, it's not for everybody. You know, um, you, you know um, there's a lot of sacrifices in the journey of being a founder, a lot of sacrifices. So it's not for everybody. Um, you've got to have a really compelling reason to do it other than the fact that it's cool to be a founder, right? That's a very bad reason. Um, but yeah, um, you develop some resilience over time. You begin. Into, you know, once you've seen a really big crisis and every, everything else looks like a minor fire to go and deal with. Um, and I think the other things you must have at least one person, but ideally more people that you can actually speak openly and honestly with. Yeah. Now, if you've got co-founders, it's there, it's right? The but I was a sole founder. Um, so I didn't, you know, I didn't have any founders like, you know, so if we were running out of money for sake of argument, um, then, you know, there's maybe one or two of my employees that I would be able to tell that to, but generally speaking, you can't just go and tell the world a, a situation like that. Uh, and, and actually, when I took time off after the business I founded, I got forwarded by startup founders wanting to ask me for advice and indeed wanting me as a non-executive director or a board advisor. And every single one of them that was early stage, I basically said, look, don't waste your money on somebody like me, right? You know, at your stage, anybody who wants money from you to advise you is not a competent advisor. Mm-hmm. In other words, they should eat, they should at least take money from the small, tiny, early stage founder. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's spend an hour together because I'm bored. 
Um, uh, and if you become really big and raise lots of money, then you pay them some money, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, so one of the things that happened a lot in those days, speaking to those early stage founders, they'd be, they'd be uh, telling the story of how they're killing it, you know, the, you know, the rah, rah, you know, um, tech bro type of thing. And I'd be like, well, look, if, if all these things are true, you didn't need me. Why on earth did you reach out to me, right? It's like, tell me what's really happening, right? And then it's like, well, you know, you're going to have to trust somebody, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am, believe it or not, a qualified accountant. Therefore, I take confidentiality very seriously. So you have to tell somebody the real problem, tell them what the real problem is, right? We can actually talk about it. And then you get under the real skin of the problem, which is very often they're thinking, is, should I just walk away and shut it down? That's one of the classic questions I found people were trying to wrestle with. So, so you must, must have somebody you can actually speak to openly. Uh, which is ideally an advisor, a mentor, or a co-founder. You talked there about um, shutting it down. You spoke there earlier saying that you, you um, left at the right time. It was uh, the right time for you to go. Um, when for other people listening to this, it's obviously one of the most difficult uh, decisions of most founders' lives because it's their baby. Uh, the, the company is their baby. They've built it to um, wherever it gets to, and it's difficult to part with it. What would be the advice to know when to, I don't want to say get up and quit and run, um, but when to, you know, just get out and uh, move on to to your next adventure? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just don't think there's a single answer to that, right? You know, sometimes the business just needs to pivot. So in other words, the question you're asking yourself is basically, is it worth giving it one more go? Um, this isn't working, but this might work. Um, and sometimes it's basically... Would you be happier not being a founder, not working eighty hour weeks? Mm -hmm. uh, upwards, um, do you need to work like balance back? Is it easier? Is it hurting your mental health? I don't think there's a single answer. Um, you know, for me, when I left, it was fairly mutual. I, I kind of was ready to leave the company. Was, you know, I was like seven or eight years in and pretty much burnt out by that point in time. Um, and, and I think my board and investors knew that and, and, and knew, knew that I needed to go. So um, uh, it was relatively easy for me. That my job was to make sure that I was handing over something that wouldn't just fall over immediately. Because, you know, you are, as a, as a founder, particularly a sole founder CEO, you are very talismanic. So whether you like it or not, you know, a lot of the business brand and equity is built around you. Yeah, sure. And so uh, um, trying to manage that elegantly was, was, was a challenge. You know, it was probably a good two years where I was kind of like trying to make sure that there was something that would, that would carry on, but, you know, be able, be able to sustain after me. And that was around a number of things, and it was around bringing in a leadership team from outside the business who weren't as emotionally attached to me and, and the journey we'd been through. Um, the early stage journey it was around a, a professional board, professional chair, um, so an independent chair. You know, all those constituents that basically mean that there's, the company is bigger than bigger than one individual. Um, was I was trying as much as possible to do because I didn't want the business to fall over and walked out the door. I mean, partly yeah. it's personal responsibility to the people that worked with you, but also, you know, it's, um, uh, um, it's something I was proud of and, and had a stake in. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about Alica. So tell me, uh, how, what was the, I, I know you went there right at the beginning for Alica, but what was the, the idea for Alica? How did it come to light? And what was kind of the MVP, the first MVP at the beginning? Yeah, so um, funnily enough, I actually remember first reading about Alica Bank five five or multiple years before i actually joined uh -huh. um, and actually back then it didn't have the name out back by the way it had a different name but um i remember reading about the concept and the concept the vision of alec bank hasn't changed much at all actually um, uh, in, in, in many many years but i remember hearing about this early the early stage concept that, that was being bounded around so um and it resonated with me because i had been learning the hard way in the same market how the world really works so um, funding options, the business I founded, is in the SME lending space, and um, uh, and uh, um, Alica is an SME bank that does lots of SME lending. What I've discovered during um, the hard way, by the way, um, mm -hmm. running funding options, in other words, discovered by mm -hmm. um, you know, no business plan to buy to first contact with the customer. So what I've discovered the hard way was that the core of the SME segment is kind of medium-sized businesses. Um, not millions of really tiny businesses. It's it's a relatively you know a few hundred thousand medium sized businesses, but kind of businesses that are dotted around industrial parks outside towns around the country, um, and small hotels on high streets. These, these this is the core BSME segment. It's much bigger and part of the economy than, than really small businesses, and that those businesses actually quite valued a relationship with their bank. Um, they, in other words, they didn't want something that was purely digital, particularly where they did something important like buying their building that they operate in or buying fleets of trucks. They wanted a human element. So 
although we are a fintech bank and the business that I built was a fintech, it was what's fashionably called high tech, high touch, where we were using yeah. technology to, make, to bring a personal element to financial services and do that efficiently and effectively. Mm-hmm. So I remember reading about what became out of the bank you know, a few years before I joined it and thinking, yeah, that, that's a great idea. And I thought nothing more about it. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then, of course, um, many years later, I found myself on the leadership team of this bank. But fundamentally, um, what we're doing at Alica Bank is actually bringing back something that's been taken away um, from, from SMEs. So in the UK, if you go back um, 10 or maybe 15 years, a, an SME in the UK, uh, a, a small and medium-sized business, would have had a local relationship manager in their local bank branch, somebody they could go to for advice, support, you know, mm-hmm. uh, help. And when they're making really consequential decisions you know, about whether to buy their premises or whatever it may be, Someone to actually talk to who's an expert in, in, in financial services in their segment. And that's been largely taken away for cost reasons from, from our target customers. Not because they didn't want it, they do absolutely want it, many of them. Um, but because the bank, the traditional high street banks couldn't make it work. And the vision of Alec Bank, which has fed stay fairly consistent through that time, was basically what if, what if you bring back the relationship management aspect? You don't need to have people in branches. You know, customers don't need to put a suit on to go and visit the branch to see somebody. You know, what if they can visit a client and, and, and pull out an iPad and talk through their cash flow? And indeed, post COVID, what if they can do it like on video like this? But effectively, how can you use technology to bring back something that customers desperately want, which is a personal human relationship um, uh, with their bank? Um, and, and we've been extremely successful. Um, you know, I've been at Alka coming up to three years. We are undoubtedly one of the fastest growing companies in the country and probably and in Europe as well. Um, we became profitable last year. Uh, in, my, in my time at Alaco, we've gone from 100 to more like 500 people in the business now, whilst being profitable at the same time, which these days is important in fintech. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and raised uh, you know, more than a couple of hundred million pounds in that time as well, most recently from TCB, who are kind of leading global investors, the investors in the likes of Netflix and Airbnb and Spotify. So we, we've really gone through the journey of becoming an exciting fintech. But I think we, above all else, we understand that fintech is, is finantech. And I think one of the mistakes that's been made in the, in the run-up to the um, uh, current tech winter is that many fintech didn't understand the thing. Um, and financial service, unfortunately, is one of those markets where um, uh, really bad you know, bad business models can look perfectly good up to a pot set point if you look mm-hmm. and, then they, uh, and we're finding some actually substantial fintechs that are really dumb. Um, uh, and, and you must have that balanced understanding of the technology aspect and also financial services, which is a very complex and indeed regulated market. I and one of our great strengths is that we have that. How do you do that then? Do you have to hire the, the fin guys and then the tech guys and mix them? Or is there such a thing where there is a, a fin and tech guy go together? Or is it a mix of both? How do yeah, you- so 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 therein lies the challenge, right? And also probably our secret source. So running, being able to run a bank is a very, very small number of people uh, that are allowed to run a bank. You know, you can't just run a bank. The, the regulator has to agree that you're allowed to run a bank. And most people who run banks spend all their time in, in traditional income effects of their career so they haven't kind of learned modern ways of doing things ways of working so um, this is why what you'll very often find amongst the incumbent banks is that they love to set up a little you know team of people in the we work and say go innovate you know that's there's, there's no worse way of doing digital than that right um you, you, you might as well just burn burn money notes on the fire right it's like you know, dis- <laughs> becoming digital is about transforming your core. It's not about doing a cool project and having a cool app on, on, in the metaverse, right? I saw one the other day, which is someone who built a, a bank branch in the metaverse. It's like, what are these people doing? <laughs> you know, it's like, what are they I'm well doing? spent. <laughs> yeah, but people are being paid a lot of money to do this nonsense, right? It's just, it's just ridiculous. So the worst way to do um, digitalization as a, as a bank is to put a bunch of people in the WeWork, some sort of way. Um, you know, you've got to rebuild your entire core because in the end, right, I mean, and anybody can call, build a cool looking app. The real challenge for banks is how they actually restructure their cost base to make them effective and efficient in a modern, modern world. And that's the real challenge, which is why you've got to be digital at your core, not at a small team in a we work. Um, so the problem is basically there's very, very few people that, that um, have the right mix of fin and tech, particularly that are allowed to run a bank. Well, we happen to be lucky in that our chief executive is one of them. 
And I, I think there's, by the way, in the UK, it's probably less than five. That's a really small number. Wow. Uh -huh. So the reason he has it is because he spent the last decade, since I used to work with him in a big bank, um, going between major banks and major fintechs. So he was the original CEO of a bank called Oak North, a fintech bank called Oak North, which is profitable and successful, but perhaps the existence being there. But he spent a few years at major banks again, and then he was number two at Revolut. And I think it was in particular at Revolut where he really began to understand what modern product development looks like. And what I mean by that is, you know, we organize ourselves um, through the medium of product. So every single engineer, software engineer, if we design a every data team member, they will see themselves as part of a product squad or a product tribe. So, um, you know, how they do their job comes from their specialist function, whether it's mm -hmm. the head of design or the head of technology, but what they work on comes from their product squad. And so, and, and what that means in practice is that, you know, we as business leaders, we work with the product teams on what they should, what we want them to try and achieve, what the objectives we want to try and achieve, and then we trust them to go and get on with the job and actually deliver it. So in other words, we kind of really believe in empowered cross-functional teams as the way to get stuff done. Now, this kind of model, it's, you know, it's endemic outside of financial services. You know, every big tech company has this kind of like product-led uh, product development. What's actually happened is that most of the big banks have begun to want to be agile. What they've actually done is just retitle people without actually changing how they do things. Uh -huh. So it's very common that people say, you're no longer a project manager, you're now a product manager. It's like they're utterly different jobs. Uh, and most good project managers will be terrible product managers. So they, they, don't, they don't seem to understand that they need to do a fundamental cultural change to actually really change how they get on with things. And the other thing is, frankly, in the major financial institutions, the kind of people who rise to the top, they tend to be these slightly sociopathic individuals who are all yeah. about fighting at turf war and uh, fighting turf wars, you know, sharp elbows. And these people are the worst possible things to people to build a, 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 a high growth organization because to deal with high growth, you need to be constantly delegating and constantly empowering. And it's kind of antithetical to the behaviors that got to the top in the first place. So uh, I think it's very, very hard for traditional financial services organizations to, um, to, to, to become effective at it. How do you, uh, so you're talking about um, the, the squads that you have as well, but how do you, um, considering that you've gone from 100 to 500 uh, people, I think you said now, um, how do you keep that kind of directness with them and kind of not just the unity, but the, I guess it's so much easier when there's less people at the beginning to make sure everyone knows what they're doing, everyone has a mission, but the, the more people that come to the company, then surely the mission kind of, uh, you lose your position a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a challenge. And I think, by the way, as, as we cross the 500 threshold, I think it probably gets harder. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I'm still at the point now where I, I know most people in the organization. Uh -huh. Not well. 500, well. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I could, um, you know what? I mean, what you really need to desperately look out for is the wrong behaviors and the wrong types of people getting into the organization because once they land and expand, it's all over. So the people who are empire builders who insist on everything going through them are very hierarchical. These people kill organizations, right? And, and the big banks, that's the majority of the people they have are these people, right? Uh -huh. And so, you know, that kind of like allowing that cancer into the, into the body is something you need to be very, very mindful of. So, you know, trying to stay close to the people we have, particularly you know, um, uh, below the low, lowest levels in terms of seniority, it's extremely important because you're looking for that, that cancer's going to come, right? We need to kill it when it comes, but we can't stop it coming into the body. We just need to deal with it when it comes. So, so how do we do? It? I, I think I think we have two hacks, and they're they're they're, they're sort of um, uh, um they're they're in different dimensions. Hack number one is our company level objectives, OKRs as we'd call them, objectives and key results are transparent. So every single member of the company can go and see the entire company's OKRs. Um, so they're broken down into sort of thematic things. You know, one is around having the best customer experience, another is around having the best marginal cost. Broken down into thematic things, but they go all the way down to specific annual key results and specific quarterly um, key results. Okay. And at the end of every course, we transparently actually put how we achieve, how we how we did against those. So in other words, we will miss many of our quarterly OKRs and it's there for everyone to see. Now, there are, of course, sometimes things that we can't let everyone see. The m &A activity, for example, some HR related stuff. So, you know, there's a small number of those OKRs that will have project code names that only a small number of people know. But we have a kind of transparency by default. We are unembarrassed about the fact we don't, you know, we stretch ourselves and we don't achieve everything we try and achieve. But every, everyone can understand how that, you know, you can be very junior 
and one of you know 20 or 30 company level OKRs can be relevant to you. You can see how yours fits into the overall picture of the key priorities for the business and how we move forward. So the first one is very, very clear and transparent OKRs, which are consistent over time. And by the way, we have a balanced scorecard against those OKRs on which stuff like compensation is decided. And it's balanced because it's not just about, you know, driving revenues or sorts of that risk mitigation, you know, managing our risks, et cetera. So we have a balanced scorecard, which again is transparent, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a we had a half time score for that this year, uh, just just recently. We're halfway through the year where we're at half time. It's all to play for is the answer. So what is transparency around objectives and key results? And as I said before, right, my job is not how to say to say to a product leader, you know, do this for your OKR, to deliver your OKR. It's this is your OKR, get it done. You, you've got the resources, you've got cross functional team, go get it done. That's element number one. Element number two, I mean, that's kind of well known. That's best practice. It's just extraordinary that other people don't do it. The other one I think is is is, is more of an internal hack. We found really powerful. We we have lots of um, short, sharp, regular governance type forums. So if I'm if I'm launching a new business, which I've done quite often since I joined here, I, I tend to um, lead quite a lot of the new business lines we we we, we run. Um, we will very often have a weekly governance meeting steer, steering committee with a small number of very senior executives, and it may be only half an hour long. Sometimes you don't need half an hour. But it's focused on, you know, um, what progress has been made, what blockers there are, what decisions need to get made. Yeah. So it's the opposite of, sort of traditional governments where senior people only get involved once a quarter and they sit around the table and pine on, on how things are going. On the mm -hmm. board. It's short, sharp, regular, it's, it's regular touch points. And it's turned out to be really, really effective. By the way, I didn't come up with that one. I, 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 that came from our CEO. Maybe he led it somewhere else, but... I would never do anything and anything but that going forward. It's turned out to be really powerful. Interesting. Tell me, with your every, last one in regards to you and your kind of um, your style, your management, your history. Um, I want to know what is your management style and why? Why do you choose this kind of management style? Yeah. So my management style is um, I work best with what I call fire and forget people and, uh, and reporting to me. What I mean by that is. Basically, um, we will, in terms of deciding the strategy, the objectives and stuff like that, and so the really bigger picture stuff, that's 50-50 between us. And I'm pretty good at strategy, um, I'd like to say. Um, so I'd like to say I add some value on that one. So the, the kind of setting the direction of travel, the strategy where we're get, trying to get to is a 50-50 activity between us. Uh -huh. But once we've agreed that, then it's 90-10. Their job is to go get the job done. Um, and of course, I'm involved to some extent in execution because I need to mainly to remove a blocker, have a conversation with somebody, whatever it may be, get some additional resources. So I'm, I'm not completely out of execution. But the reason I use the expression fire and forget is because basically the people I work best with are the ones where they go and get the job done. Um, and if there's anything going wrong, they come and tell me about it. So in other words, I, I, I don't need to constantly ask them about something because I know they're going to come and tell me if I need to know. Um, and and very, very transparent, metrics driven. Um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. You've got to have a discipline of not just having a talking shop every time we get together. It's like, what do we agree we'll get done in the last two weeks? What are the metrics we're meant to have achieved? So we're actually making sure we actually stay focused on it. So yeah, so um, uh, for me, it's around um, empowerment, not in a soft, fluffy way. It's just the only way that I can actually scale because as I'm fond of saying to my peers, like when we're 10 times bigger, we can't work 10 times harder. So only by kind of like obsessively trying to get the best talent in terms of particularly in terms of execution discipline is the only way we're actually going to manage this. And it may sound heuristic to say when we're 10 times bigger, but you know, we, we are 10 times bigger than, than 10 a couple of years ago. So, uh, and we will be 10, I hope 10 times bigger again before we know it. So, um, uh, you know, there is no way that I can work 10 times harder. There literally aren't enough hours in the week to use expression. So, um, so yeah, that's my management style. And what does that mean? In, in a high growth scale up, yeah, the single most important attribute of a leader is the ability to attract and retain the best talent. Again, for the same reason, which is basically that your ability to actually do the day job rapidly diminishes the business scale. So therefore, you must have people who are better at you than doing the day job. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, in, in their specialism, every single one of my reports is better at their job than I am. Right? In other words, like if, if, I, if I was full-time doing their job, I'd do a worse job. And, and I think that's a key part of my role. So is it like as a leader, um, as a leader, often you find those people, but it's pretty much what you just said, as a leader, you find those people which can do the job better because your, uh, I guess your skill is more about finding those people, retaining those people, making those people flourish. Yeah, that's uh, a sign of a good leader. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I mean, this is something I learned as a CEO. I think there's generically three types of CEO. Yeah. Um, there's the um, sort of vision, bigger picture guy. That's mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go your gal. Uh, and then there's the kind of sales leader type who's both based in just very good and motivated the trips. And, you know, uh, you know, we already know what we're doing. We have product market fit, which is even much bigger. So we need to just drive. And then there's the kind of COO type one who's all about execution discipline. Yeah. Now, I think occasionally you get um, a CEO who has two of the, two of those dimensions, and I imagine occasionally three. But I've yet to meet such a person. But the point is, the point I'm making is that you need to be self-aware which of those you are, which of them you're not. So I was definitely the kind of the, the product visionary type person. So you know, put me in front of the team and, and talk through what we're doing the next six months. They'll go away, puff, and everyone's going to go and you know, build something really great. Right? But am I the person who's going to come in every morning and puff up the trees and stand up? No. Uh, because I'm a terrible person in the morning. I'm I'm grumpy and I'm ha- I'm happy. I'm the last person to pump up people in the morning. I need to be pumped up, and I'm also not the COO person because I'm not that kind of natural complete finisher. You know, it's down every detail. So you must be self-aware about you know which of those you are, and then plug in and the people who are naturally good at those things. Yeah, and that's one of the things I got right. And uh, as a founder at Funding Options, and I talked about that person I'd hired for my expense, but you know that was the sales leader I knew and needed. We had a product market fit, but I was never going to be able to make. The, the business fly mm-hmm. i needed that person so um, it's about being self-aware and, and you know and that means my leadership style, style tends to work quite well as long as i find right the right people in sort of the execution goals i think if you're a natural detail person like a coo type mentality you've got to fight the um you've got to fight the tendency to micromanage yeah and so in other words you've got to understand your own demon i know my demons and i, and I manage around them you've got to be set to that that's big yeah yeah but trust me, the founder CEO, you have no choice but to face into your demons, right? No, no. You, you either face into them or you die. Absolutely. <laughs> Pretty much. Absolutely. Tell me, last question for you, Conrad. Um, with uh, regards to FinTech and where it's going, there's been lots of um, development developments over the last five, six, seven years with FinTech. Uh, many people are saying it's kind of hit this kind of, not hit the wall, but it's hit this kind of stagnation kind of moment. Um, where is fintech going? Um, I don't think it's met, met a stagnation moment, but I think we are, you know, for, for the younger amongst us, they don't. There's many people who probably don't realise that we've returned to normal economic conditions, so it's perfectly normal to have interest rates of a few percent. No, I think that's a steady state for over the last few years, few uh, century or so. The UK would be a few percent. So the fact that we've got five percent or just over five percent interest rates, which seems to be freaking people out. Okay. Um, the thing that should have freaked out people out is we had pretty much zero interest rates for the last 10 years, which was the first time in recorded history of many centuries that happened. Yeah. Uh, so we are returning to normal economic conditions at the moment. And that is basically, that has just absolutely bashed open large swathes of the fintech community. But it's, you know, frankly, my point about fin and tech needs to be imbalanced, right? If you're caught out by the fact of by, by an interest rates returning to historic norms, then frankly, you shouldn't be running financial services business. So um, what I think, you know, with interest rates in a normal envi- in a normal situation, the pecking order of financial services is kind of being re- re-established and the, um, at the top of the pecking order is banks. It was always thus, but um, banks sit at the top of the, of, of the food chain in the, the financial services. Um, and that means that I think the phase of fintech we're in at the moment is um, the power of well, the most successful fintechs tend to be ones that are either um, uh, helping banks to become more technology technology driven, so it's sort of banking as a service, platform as a service, that sort of thing. And um, they're doing really well. So it's helping the banks actually, you know, just this new reality rather than trying to compete with them. Or in the case of Alica Bank, there are some challenger banks like us, but not the only one that are basically focused as a bank. We are a bank focused on niches that the incumbent banks struggle with. So uh, I think those are the t- you know it's it's not a period of stagnation it's actually a period of reorient- reorientation of the market. Uh-huh. But I think in many ways it's probably a more golden period for fintech um, than than any other, because you know there's people are building real businesses now you know not ones that are plumped up by dumb VCs right. Um, they're building real businesses now, profitable businesses that can you know, um, survive through the, the through through the decades, um, and that, I think that's what we're building at Amica. Absolutely. Um, guys, I don't know about you, but I've learned so much today listening to Conrad. So Conrad Ford, Alec Bank. Conrad, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great to pick your brain and to hear everything that you're doing, your past and hopefully the future as well. Thank you.